children ask some interesting questions. There's a story of a Sunday school teacher who uh, one day was talking about Jesus as a good shepherd and how he will leave 99 sheep to find the one who has gotten lost. And one little boy, hopeful, then asked the question, did Jesus live in a zoo? Another little girl once asked, are there toilets in heaven? One time I was, I was explaining how Jesus wasn't 50% God and 50% human. He was 100% God and 100% human. And I was telling this to my daughter, and my daughter then begins calculating in her head and asks, does that make Jesus 200%? Well, not quite. But I try to encourage my children to ask questions, uh, any question they want about God. And actually, it's what we do with youths as well, because they do have questions. And yes, sometimes the questions might require uh, a complicated answer or be difficult to answer, especially if we have no idea how to answer them. But it's good to encourage the younger ones to ask questions about God, and that's how they learn. Their questions provide us, who have been Christians a lot longer, opportunities to help them understand who God is. It might put us on the spot a bit if, if it's something we've not thought of before. But the way I see it, it's how we learn as well. And even if we don't have an answer to give, that question gives us an opportunity or challenge to learn further as we look for an answer. And we're looking at Deuteronomy 6, 20 to 25 today. And this will be our final, um, our final sermon in our series in Deuteronomy. Now the way Moses starts out this section, I think he's quite insightful. Maybe Moses is speaking from experience. He has, he has children who probably asked him questions about God. And he says this, in the future, when your son or daughter asks you, what is the meaning of the stipulations, decrees and laws the Lord our God has commanded? Moses is telling the Israelites, your children will ask you questions. But it's not any and all questions Moses brings up. It's a specific one that Moses anticipates and wants to address. Why do we live or why do we have to live this way? And even today, this is a question that tends to come up once in a while. Why do Christians have to do this or do that? And I think what's implied in that question is another question. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to make whatever sacrifices are needed to follow God's ways? Is it worth it to rearrange my entire life to have God as my center. Is it worth it? So to help the Israelites with uh, what to pass on to the next generation, and I suppose anybody else who, who asks, Moses gives his answer in three parts. He says, tell their story, tell of the requirements, and tell of the results. Tell the story. Tell them we were slaves of Pharaoh in Egypt, but the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Before our eyes, the Lord sent signs and wonders, great and terrible, on Egypt and Pharaoh and his whole household. But he brought us out from there to bring us in and give us the land he promised on oath to our ancestors. The story is about the deliverance the Israelites experienced. Moses is telling them to tell their story. Stories reveal and remind. They reveal to the person asking what the story of the Israelites is. And they remind the Israelites all they've been through. Tell their story. Tell the story of experiencing God's freedom. Pharaoh had enslaved the Israelites. Hey, listen to some of the descriptions used in Exodus. Uh, we must deal shrewdly with them, Pharaoh says. 
They put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And then they made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. So they were slaves. Slaves have no rights. Slaves have no freedom. Slaves have no voice. Slaves have no intrinsic value. And the purpose was simply to do what Pharaoh wanted. And he wanted the Israelites to suffer. As well, to stop them from multiplying so much, from increasing in, in their numbers, Pharaoh consented to genocide of Jewish baby boys. Throw them all into the Nile River. The Nile, which was um, Egypt's main source of water and hence supposed to be a symbol of life. Pharaoh uses the source of life as an instrument of death. And, oh yeah, by the way, people would drink from that water. This was a kind of kingdom God rescued them from. A kingdom of slavery, a kingdom of darkness, a kingdom of ruthlessness. A kingdom stained with the death of young Israelites. And God took them out of Egypt. Now with God taking them out of Egypt, he didn't just leave them on their own. Because it would have been easy for Perhaps another nation to just swoop in and round up the Israelites and enslave them again. Same story, different setting. But the rescue from under, is, uh, under Pharaoh's rule in Egypt was to bring the Israelites under another king, God himself, and his kingdom. But unlike Egypt, God's kingdom was a kingdom of belonging, of holiness, of love, and of grace. It's a kingdom where God fights for his people provides homes for his subjects, blesses the nation with abundance. They are free from slavery and can now thrive. We Christians have our stories of freedom. Freedom from the kingdom of darkness, of sin, of self. Our lives were destined to, um, to separation from God, a result of being locked in the prison of sin. But God unlocked the doors to that prison and took us into a new kingdom where we were not bound slaves, but free servants of a good and holy king. We are wanted and valued because we're made in that king's image and he loves each one of us. And often that relationship with God comes with change in our lives. For some it's a drastic change from being in darkness to now living in light. For others that change might be more subtle or gradual. It might be a change in the way you live your life, a change in your uh, desires or priorities. It might be a change in perspective or focus. Whatever it might be, tell the story of how God freed you. And tell the story of God's might. God knows exactly what he was capable of, and he knows what Pharaoh was capable of. There was never any doubt in God's mind about who's in charge or who would prevail in the battle of might between the powers of Egypt and the true God of the universe. And that battle begins with uh, that snake show in Exodus. Moses' brother-in-law, Aaron, throws down his staff before Pharaoh and turns it into a snake. And Pharaoh's like, oh, cool trick, bro. And he calls his own sorcerers and magicians to do the same thing. And so you have all these snakes just slithering around on the ground. But what happens next is Aaron's snake attacks and swallows all the other snakes there. Now snakes are a symbol of power in Egypt. But Egypt has nothing compared to God. And then from there we get the ten plagues. And you know, God shows his power and authority over the so-called gods of Egypt. For example, the Nile was considered a god. Uh, there was a god of fertility with the, the head of a frog. There was a god that looked like, uh, like a cow. And of course, Pharaoh himself who was seen as uh, the, son, the son of the sun god. And God brings chaos to whatever order of the gods in Egypt. 
God shows his authority over the forces of nature and life. And, and on it goes, you know, the crossing of the Red Sea, the miracles with water and food in the desert, the victorious battles against other nations. Israel experienced God's authority to bring judgment on those who set themselves up to be an enemy of God. Who can compare to God? Who is his equal? No one. And that's the point. He has no equal. He has no rival. What are the powerful moments in your life where God demonstrated his might? Maybe you did experience something powerful, something uh, unusual, something unexplainable. One story for myself, you know, I, I experienced God's healing here uh, at LCAC one, one Sunday. I'd been suffering from uh, pain in a particular spot on my back for years and after someone prayed for it that week the pain miraculously stopped and it hasn't returned since now it wasn't life-threatening and you know i could probably live with it for the rest of my life and it was, it was just annoying but you know more than the healing i think the more powerful moment for me was just a revelation of just how much even these little things in our lives matter to God. For you, per perhaps it's provision coming at the right time or an opportunity God had opened up or an answer to prayer. You know, these are the stories we need to tell. And sometimes I think we don't have enough of these encouraging stories um, actively being shared among us. And all of us, whether we're part of an older generation or younger generation or somewhere in the middle, need to hear more of these personal stories to know that God is at work among us. And tell the story of God of receiving God's promise. The promise of their own land was made to, the, to their forefathers, but no one knew just how long it would take to get that land. After wandering in the wilderness, the Israelites were now prepared to receive God's blessing of the promised land, a, a place of their own. This was a big deal. They've been without a home for almost 40 years, 40 years of wandering, moving around, not being settled, having nowhere to belong, nowhere to be at rest. But now they were at the cusp of having a place to belong, a place to return to when they leave, a place where families can lay down roots where the elderly can be laid to rest, where the next generation can grow up, where all of Israel can call home. What are God's promises you have seen fulfilled in your life? His promise to always be with you? His promise of peace? Promise of upholding you? Promise of directing your steps, perhaps? It might be good for us to go back and look at what God promises to us in his word. The more promises we know, the more we recognize how he fulfills them. So, tell your story. And the second thing Moses says is uh, that they are to tell of the requirements of God. The Lord commanded us to obey all these decrees and to fear the Lord our God. You know, as citizens of God's kingdom, what are the requirements to live in God's kingdom, under God's rule? If you ever move to a new country, it's, it's good to know how things work there, how things will be different, what things will be done differently, what laws are different, what uh, new customs and ways do we need to learn. When my wife and I came to the UK to visit uh, LCAC for the first time, I made a mental note of uh, of of many things I'd uh, we'd have to adjust, you know, if we were to move here, expectations, rules, etc. And you know, driving was one of them. Uh, this is this is a big thing in my mind. You know, in 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 Canada, the steering wheel is on the is on the left uh, left of the car, inside the car, and Canadians we drive on the right hand side of the road. And, you know, I, I can't come to the UK and, 
and, and insist to the DVLA that I be allowed to drive on the right side of the road. Because if I live here, there are certain things I'm required to do. So what does God require for his people? Two things, Moses writes. Obedience to and reverence for God. Tell your children that's what God wants from us. To live our lives to obey his law. A law that reflects all uh, that God values. Character, life, grace, integrity, holiness, love. God reveals how best to live in a way that truly reflects the values of his kingdom. No other way will be able to bring out our calling to be human beings made in the image of God. God, the creator of all things and all people, shows his creation how best to live. And we get in trouble when we steer away from that, from obedience to God. So there's obedience, but obedience isn't the only requirement. There's also the fear of God or, or this reverence toward God. And this idea encompasses a lot of other ideas like uh, love and worship and humility and surrender. But it's an attitude or a, a posture of the heart toward God. Both are needed. Obedience and reverence together. Attitude and action. Attitude reflects itself in action. And action is done out of that attitude. In later generations, Israel forgot about that. They concluded uh, wrongly that righteousness before God was to, um, to ensure that they followed the practices and rituals of the covenant. They failed to remember that the actions God wants are to come out of a gratitude of come out of gratitude and love for God. In a relationship that we might have, our actions are done because we love the other person, not because we feel we have to do them. So we sometimes forget the reverence part. And Perhaps when we're talking to our children or others about Christianity, we might end up turning Christianity into a list of things to do. Go to church, sing songs, pray, help your neighbor, and so on. We can describe what a Christian would do, but be careful not to reduce our relationship with God into being only about external action. To be a Christian means to love God. And loving God means we want to please Him by living life that reflects Him and the love we have for Him. Thirdly, tell the results. You know, two things Moses writes in verse 24. He says, so that we might always prosper and be kept alive. In other words, you could say, you will be blessed. You know, if you look ahead to Deuteronomy 28, 28 it talks about some examples of blessings of, <clears throat> of prosperity that await the Israelites if they obey God's word. Your homes will be blessed, your children will be blessed, your fridges and freezers will be blessed, your work will be blessed. And we're not given the specifics of what the blessings will look like, and I don't think that's the point. I think the point is that we would be able to say with all honesty, sincerity, and humility, God has blessed us. And then, well, what does it mean to be kept alive? Well, in, in its context in Deuteronomy, it doesn't mean that each Israel is going to live forever. That's not, you know, that, that's not true. We, we can see that uh, very clearly. But it meant that the community, Israel, would not be wiped out from history. They're going to be around. They won't be like some of the other nations who will be conquered or destroyed and, and fade out of history. But they would be a testimony, Israel would be a testimony to God maintaining and sustaining their life. These are the blessings of God. And so, this is how we teach. 
This is how we disciple, how we remind and help others to know who God is and who we are. But where does this all lead? Verse 25. And if we are careful to obey all the law before the Lord our God, as he has commanded us, that will be our righteousness. This is where it all leads. God's verdict. Those who faithfully obey the law and fear the Lord, God will declare them righteous. Theologian J.I. Packer once said, A good way of understanding righteousness is to think of it as right relationship. Righteousness is right relationship. That's what it is. To be righteous is to have or be in a right relationship with God. And so, you will hear one day, you are righteous. You have lived rightly. You have lived to honor the relationship we have. You have done well in living a life worthy of my name. Or better yet, in Jesus' words, well done, good and faithful servant. To hear those words when we come face to face with God one day, all the striving for holiness, the struggle and temptation, the sacrifices we make um, for character that pleases God, the resolve to be faithful and live obediently to God's way, despite what people think or say, it will be worth it all. Let's pray. Father God, throughout this chapter, you have reminded us over and over the importance of obeying your word and having a heart that reveres or that fears you. You've reminded us that in everything we do, we are to love you. You've reminded us That when we have plenty, when we are living in abundance, we are not to forget you. And we recognize, God, that you tell us this not because you're trying to control us, not because you're trying to ruin our lives, but because you want us to have a right relationship with you. And so, Lord... Give us that resolve, that desire to have a right relationship with you. And may we hear one day that recognition, well done, good and faithful servant. on that day we will recognize that everything we've done our desire to please you the choices we've made to honor you have been worth it Lord may we live for your glory and for your glory alone in Jesus name we pray Amen.